the National Capital Branch of the Canadian uh, uh, International uh, Council. Welcome and thank you for attending uh, this evening's event. My name is Max Cameron and I teach in the Department of Political Science at the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs at UBC. And I'm speaking to you from the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Coast Salish First Nations, the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil Many of you are on unceded Algonquin and Anishinaabe territory, but wherever you may be, I hope that you will take a moment to reflect on the history that brought you to reside on the lands of these Americas and to seek to understand your place in that history. It's my pleasure to be the moderator this evening. We have some stellar speakers on hand and I anticipate uh, an informative and fascinating discussion. Before I introduce them, I want to take a moment to tell you about the Canadian International Council. The CIC has existed since 1928 with 14 branches across Canada. It has a mandate to foster dialogue and discussion on key foreign policy issues for Canadians. The ongoing situation in Venezuela is one such issue with implications for Canada, particularly as we approach the summit of the Americas next week and as we think about Canada's approach to democratic development around the world. The National Capital Branch of the CIC, which is hosting this event, also has numerous study groups focused on certain regions of the world, including Latin America and the Caribbean. And if you'd like to learn more about the CIC and to become a member, please visit www.thecic.org. Today's event is entitled Voices of Leadership, Women in Venezuela. Our presenters today know that women have been disproportionately affected by the Venezuelan crisis. As parties prepare to gather in Mexico City for the next round of negotiations on Venezuela's future, what role can women play in shaping the democratic transition and creating conditions for a lasting peace? How can women contribute as leaders to policy, diplomacy, and change in civil society? Well, a group of Venezuelans, Mujeres por la Democracia in Venezuela, or MDV, is committed to inclusive democratic change. The group includes political leaders, negotiators, human rights defenders, lawyers, policy experts, and journalists from inside and outside of Venezuela. Women for Democracy in Venezuela works to empower women within Venezuela's political process and to ensure their inclusion in high level negotiations. With that, I'd like to introduce our three guests this evening. Ambassador Isadora Zubiaga is Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs for the, for the Venezuelan interim government and co-founder of Women for Democracy in Venezuela. Among other roles, Ambassador Zubiaga previously served as Director of Speak Truth to Power, a human rights project of the Robert F. Kennedy Foundation and as International Coordinator of NYC 2010 under the leadership of Michael Bloomberg, as well as Vice President of eQuest Partners and CEO of LA uh, Almazara. Ambassador Zubiaga holds a bachelor's degree in economics and political science from the University of Boston and a master's degree in international relations from the, the Sorbonne in Paris. Deputy Manuela Bolivar is a member of the Venezuelan parliament. She's also the president of the subcommittee on women and, Ge and gender equality and the executive director of Proyecto Nodriza, uh, which I understand is a project that supports pregnant women and women with small children. Cristina Burelli is a Venezuelan American social entrepreneur and environmental activist. She's founder and executive director of the V5 Institute, a nonprofit that leads and supports broad initiatives that promote better and more informed policymaking and governance at the national and international level. She's also the international liaison of the environmental advocacy group SOS Orinoco from, 20, uh, from 2002 to 2014. She was the executive director of Alliance for the Family. She matriculated at Queen's College, Cambridge in 1981 and read for an MA in social anthropology. I think it would be 
so today we will begin with a set of questions for the participants and uh, we'd be welcome, we'd be very pleased to take questions from uh, the audience as well. Please uh, enter your questions into the Q&A uh, and I'll do my best as we have this conversation uh, to, to introduce those questions as well as I can uh, within the constraints of the uh, hour that we have uh, with our, our distinguished guests. But let me begin by inviting uh, each of our guests to tell us a little bit about yourselves, and in particular, about your role in this initiative, Women for Democracy in Venezuela. Perhaps I could start with you, uh, Ambassador uh, Zubiaga. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Cameron, for what a wonderful introduction. It really, uh, it's an honor, and thank you also to CIC for hosting this event, and uh, I am, Personally, and I think that I can speak in the name of Venezuela, we are so thankful to Canada. Uh, uh, we are actually in Ottawa, even though this event is uh, virtual, uh, but uh, one feels the importance of this country uh, in, and, and, and the, the, the work that you do from every angle, not only government, but also civil society, think tanks, universities, um, when it comes to Human rights and to be on, you know, on the real and the, the right issues to defend democracy and to defend human dignity. So I can only be just incredibly thankful for all the work that you have done uh, from every single angle, uh, as I said before. So, and it's inspiring, also. So um, what we have done has a lot to do with inspiration. Um, that's why I, I, that, you know, I, uh, we have put together a group of uh, women under the movement uh, of Venezuelan Women for Democracy because we thought um, that, that the voices of women were not being um, sufficiently heard from women in Venezuela that were doing incredible work and also Venezuelan women in the diaspora. And we needed to make sure that those voices were heard internationally. Um, also, there is another element that is relevant uh, about this movement, and it's that it's not only political voices. Um, we do have incredible women in the National Assembly, in the interim government of Venezuela, but we also wanted to open the movement and, 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 and um, to have a magnifying um, um, glass to see women that were working and were doing incredible um, incredible work from the civil society. Uh, so this is very important because it's, it really transcends uh, the work of um, only politics and uh, incorporates the work from civil society in Venezuela that sometimes is so undermined. And it also has an emphasis in in, in building the bridge between what the Venezuelan women are doing inside Venezuela, which has certain characteristics, and, and the work that the Venezuelan women are doing in the diaspora. So um, this was the, 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 the beginning of um, putting together this group and working also on issues, on policies. And um, so that's why it was very important for us to to, to uh, have light on issues that we thought were fundamental in Venezuela and that were being discussed, um, some were being very broadly discussed, like you know the issues of from the humanitarian front, but but there were issues also that were not um, that were not visible enough, like the environment and things that were happening, for example, in southern Venezuela. And Cristina will tell you more about that. Um, but there are other issues like international justice and accountability, and there are issues about democracy and how we approach elections and how we approach the biggest challenges that we have in front of us from an angle, uh, from, you know, incorporating the angle of women um, who are the most vulner vulnerable, you know, um, um, affected in this humanitarian uh, complex crisis that we have in Venezuela. Um, and also probably some of the most important builders for solutions uh, looking into the future. 
I don't want to extend too much because I want to like exchange in the Q and A. But as an introduction, I think that this is uh, this is my part, and I'm looking forward to answering questions. Thank you very, very much. That's perfect. Uh, Deputy Bolivar, would you like to say a little bit about yourself and your role in, in Venezuelan politics, and what also uh, in the um, uh, uh, Women for Democracy movement? Okay. Well, as, uh, as I say, thanks for the opportunity. I am Manuela Bolivar. I'm a member of the Venezuelan National Assembly elected in 2015. A president of the Subcommission of Women for Women and Gender Equality, and a member of the Humanitarian Commission of the National Assembly. In that responsibility, I have to the privilege to, of working with donors and international, uh, international humanitarian agencies to broaden the humanitarian space in the country and make sure Venezuelans have access to the humanitarian aid they need. I am particularly proud of leading the program Heroes de la Salud Health Heroes that provide financial support to frontline health workers fighting COVID-19. I had also worked with PAHO in UNICEF to use some of the frozen assets uh, um, uh, of the country to found the call of change for COVID vaccination programs. It is my fundamental belief that equal participation of women, women in politics is part of the democratic transi transition Venezuela must go through. Um, I want to say also when we thought about the situa political situation in Venezuela, the way forward is a negotiating transition that opens the door for the restoration of the democratic and fundamental rights and ensures wide political guarantees for all the sectors. In that case, the participation of women is a fundamental, is a, is a key, is really, is really important. In Venezuela right now, there is a false narrative being actively promoted by uh, Maduro's propaganda apparatus that Venezuela has been fixed, es decir, Venezuela se arregló. Disorderly, the liberalization and hyperinflation a uh, uh, hyperinflation control account for the reappearance of products in Venezuela shelves, but 95% of the population can buy them because they are under the poverty line. Don't let anyone fool fool you. The situation inside Venezuela continues to worsen. Poverty is endemic. Human rights abuses are rampant. Political oppression continues. The environment has, has, uh, is being decimated. The situation is particularly bad for women who are disproportionately affected by sexual and gender-based violence, human trafficking, and lack of access to health care. So for us, it's really important to take take seriously the negotiation process and in that in that process is uh, we we as a, a women we have a key role in that thank you very much uh christina morelli uh, could you give us your perspective on both your role and uh in particular the role of women uh, in venezuela today Thank you so much to CIC and, and to you, Professor uh, Cameron, for this opportunity. Um, and I could just I just have to reiterate uh, Isadora's words and, and, and appreciation towards Canada, who has been, you know, so um, committed and interested in all of these very, very important topics. Um, my topic uh, in particular is the environment. Um, in 2018, um, I started, I founded SOS Orinoco with a group of experts, mostly living inside of Venezuela, uh, to investigate and, and do advocacy about the horrific uh, illegal mining that is taking place in southern Venezuela. And we've been working for the most part, um, I'm kind of the visible face of a, of a team that has been working anonymously due to the high risk of doing this type of activity in Venezuela. And our commitment has been to document and create an in-depth diagnostic of the region south of the Orinoco River to raise awareness about the tragedy that is unfolding and to outline urgent measures that need to be taken in order to halt the human and environmental catastrophe. And I have to say that um, the human catastrophe is affecting indigenous populations, and in particular, women and children 
within the indigenous uh, populations. So I just wanna, um, very few people know about Venezuela and Amazonia and, and even Venezuelans don't really know about Venezuela and Amazonia. And this is a, an environmental tragedy that nobody talks about. Uh, you hear a lot about Brazil, you do not hear about what's going on in Southern Venezuela. So I just wanna outline a couple of key points and then um, we can discuss uh, you know, questions and so forth. So the first thing is that Venezuela is one of the top 10 mega biodiverse countries in the world, along with Brazil, Colombia, United States. So, um, but it's also the country that is suffering probably the worst environmental crisis in the Western hemisphere, the highest deforestation rate in the Americas and probably the highest rate of illegal mining. Uh, nobody knows this and nobody talks about it. 60% of the national territory lies south of the Orinoco River with only 10% of Venezuela's population. And of that 10% uh, of the population, there are 27 indigenous and tribal peoples all with their unique cultures. And the Orinoco River Basin is in Amazonia, but also the Guyana Shield. So there's a pre-Cambrian geological formation um, unique biodiver biodiversity, and it's being decimated by the fact that Maduro, the Maduro regime, is skirting international sanctions at the expense of Venezuela's pristine biodiversity. So they've uh, basically invented uh, an illegal uh, mining policy called the, the Arco Minero, the Orinoco Mining Arc Decree, which was illegal. It was not uh, ratified. It wasn't uh, approved by the uh, National Assembly. And with this, they've opened up 12% of the entire country. It's the size of Portugal to chaotic, illegal mining. Um, and this is impacting all of Southern Venezuela, including protected areas, including a World Heritage Site, which is Canaima National Park. It's a, the, the home of Angel Falls. So the regime is basically signaling that indiscriminate mining that causes deforestation, sedimentation, mercury poisoning of rivers and indigenous populations has been given priority over the preservation of the extremely delicate environment south of uh, the Orinoco. So, you know, you need to put this into the context and introduce this into the conversation about negotiations, uh, about, you know, how to deal with the, the regime. Sadly, the environment has not been part of these conversations. And that is my quest. Um, and in this group of women, uh, democratic women of Venezuela, I have been trying to bring more information so that this incredibly um, urgent matter be introduced into all of these negotiations. Well, th thank you very much for, for, for all of that. And I, I'd really like to ask uh, for each of you to talk a little bit about the role that women are playing uh, in, in leadership in Venezuela today. Um, I'll, I'll tell you by way of background that uh, I uh, run a training program for people who aspire to enter politics. And I've noticed very big differences in the <laughs> style of leadership of women and men. I don't think it's a surprise probably to you to hear that we find that women are often far more collaborative, uh, far more willing to share um, the spotlight um, and, and often play a, a particular kind of leadership role that, that, that men seem to find harder uh, to, to, to play. What is your experience? And maybe if we could start with um, Deputy Bolivar, how well represented are women in the Venezuelan legislature? How well represented are they both on the part of government and, and opposition? And what difference does it does it make in terms of Venezuelan politics? And then and perhaps I'd like to move to Isadora, to, to uh, Deputy Minister um, 
uh, assistant deputy um, Zubiaga to, to, to reflect on how women can play a role getting their issues onto the agenda in international negotiations. And then uh, finally, back to, to you, um, uh, Christina, if you could speak to um, the role of women in some of these issues like the environment and, and, and illegal mining. So let me begin with um, uh, Deputy Bolivar. Okay, thank you. Well, in my case, uh, as, a politic, uh, as a politician, I believe that women are more tend to create co coalitions even if if our parties are in you know in maybe in you know they have problems are in my experience it's more easier to talk and to make possible negotiations when we are when are women in the middle no so when we talk about the situation and and and, and and I, and I need to link with the, the political process. If we are talking about the transition to democracy in Venezuela, it's a key factor, it's an, it's a, an inclusion. And we, if, we talk, if we are talking about inclusion, we need to talk about women. Women have a fundamental role in the reunification of the democratic forces and in helping all groups to refocus their energy to push the agenda of the democratization on the reestablishment of fundamental rights in Venezuela, not only in parties, NGOs, uh, social movements. We must be able to overcome mistrust and group instincts, so characteristic of political activity in our country, to be the bridge that strengthened the work of organizations for the common good. And in my experience, I found it in when when our women's in, in the in the process. We must be brave to work together across party lines to ensure that we are present and united from against the dictatorship. I I also want to say that women women also have an important role to play in the negotiation in, in Mexico. And right now we have a lack because there is only two women in all the process. Uh, but uh, this group and the and the by the leading of Isadora and all this the, and all the team, this group of women that are part of this mo this movement are pushing and trying to put the names of not only politicians, all uh, experts, and all the all um, uh, women that have ideas to say and and have the, you know the energy to make possible agreements that uh, allow the country to get into a transition process that is all need for the population so i don't know if i i answered your your question but i believe i strongly believe that we cannot talk about a democratic process we cannot talk about negotiation a, a, a strongly negotiation process if we don't have women in in these talkings Absolutely, thank you. That's fantastic. Um, Ambassador Zubiaga, could you speak to this issue of women's role in the negotiations? Why aren't there more women? How do you get more women involved? And what difference does it make having women at the table? Can you, can you speak to that for us? Well, um, I was looking at the list of the participants to see how much I can say. <laughs> but I'll be honest, I'll be honest like I've always been. Um, to be on the table is not easy. And it's not easy anywhere in the world, but I can tell you it's definitely not easy. Can you see me? Yes. It's definitely not easy for, for Venezuela. We have fought every inch of the spaces that we have had so far. And as Manuela said, we don't have enough yet. And the benefits of having women on the table and on the decision-making processes and being visible, it's our, our huge i mean and, and this has been documented so i don't have to tell you you know the percentages of processes that involved women are much higher to succeed and are much higher to 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 have uh, sustainability you know to be sustained in time um that, that that's all been studied and documented um we have had a very big effort from within and from outside and this is uh, second point that I want to make, the importance of the international community on this issue. I can tell you that there would be not even one woman sitting on that Mexican delegation if there wasn't because we pushed from within and there was 
uh, support from the international allies, uh, including Canada, but not only Canada, of course, but I'm, I'm, I am absolutely posi posi positive that Canada is one of the uh, most important countries, at least our, ally, our, our allies, that are encouraging the issues of democracy, of the environment, and of women uh, that have allowed us to um, have a role on the table. And I have to say, I, you know, I, I keep saying this because I think it's very important. We are not, um, our presence is not there to, 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 for, the, for the photo. And, 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 and I'm sorry to say it this way, but, but you know, it's, it's not about counting women on the table. It's to have women that count. And this is very important also. And that's why uh, this movement is putting a lot of um, interest in the expertise of women. And so wherever they are, if you know, wherever they are, if you have an expertise on the issues that are important to change Venezuela for the better, to make Venezuela a democracy, to have to discuss the issues that actually can affect the destiny of Venezuela. And I'm speaking specifically, if I wasn't very clear, about changing the current regime and bringing democracy back to Venezuela, which means prosperity and where women can play an incredible role, not only in the making, but also in the reconstruction, the reconciliation and the reconstruction of the country. So this is a battle that we're, that we're fighting and it's not over. I mean, this is just the beginning. At least now we're seeing a few faces of very important Venezuelan leaders, as I said before, in politics, as well as civil society, as well as you know, private sector outside Venezuela and inside Venezuela, but we need to see those faces and we need the support of the international community of think tanks, of governments, um, you know, uh, 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 from every single angle and making sure that, that our allies as well, um, uh, how would you say, uh, demand the presence of women on every table and beyond Mexico, by the way, you know, Mexico is one stage of the of the of the path moving forward, and and we're doing all it is possible from the democratic forces of Venezuela to come back to the Mexican negotiations. But it doesn't depend on us; it depends on on, on many factors. So we cannot only think about Mexico. We need to think about the entire process. It's Mexico. It's the process of the elections where women have to participate in a, in a, in a way that it's, that it's um, inclusive and equitable and, uh, and, and, and without donation. Uh, it needs to be also thought when we reconcile the country, we need to reach out to, this, you know, to the other side, to the, to the entire um, you know, political spectrum, and we need to rebuild the country and women will be fundamental so, you know, I, mean, I, I can go on, but I just want to leave Christina to, you know, to, to, to answer as well, and, you know, we'll continue with the dynamic. Yes, please. Go, go ahead, uh, Ms. Morelli, if you would, and, and perhaps you've, sp you've already spoken about the, uh, the environment, deforestation, uh, the humanitarian crisis, uh, uh, the impact of COVID um, and illegal mining. Many of these things have impacted on women disproportionately. Can you speak to that and then to how those issues get brought into the conversation um, around um, moving forward for Venezuela? I want to be a little bit provocative here. And I'm not a politician. What doesn't cease to surprise me is that this new, and I say new because Venezuela in the 20th century was on the forefront of environmental issues, of, environment, of protecting the environment, protecting indigenous people, but also of women in politics, in business, in all spheres of life in Venezuela. The Chavistas have a lot of women and a lot of very powerful women in very prominent positions. Some of the top women in Chavismo, in the regime are women. But why don't the opposition have women in their parties? Why don't, why don't they have top leaders 
visible in their, in their parties. That is a regression. So this reflects badly on the opposition in Venezuela and of the key parties in Venezuela, the four main parties. Why? I have no idea. I have to say that in my work with environment, the most courageous and the most prominent uh, people covering the environmental issues are women. Most of the journalists who are working in Southern Venezuela are women, risking their lives, risking their families, risking their careers. They're out there on the front lines. Many of the environmentalists are women. So I, I see another aspect, another dimension of the role of women, which is you know, very much in line with what the role of Venezuelan women was in the 20th century. I have no idea why these parties, and I'm not affiliated to any of these parties, Ale, Pejota, uh, you know, none of these, they've all become machista. And I have no idea why. Uh, well, that's a great question. Um, Ambassador Zubiago or, or Deputy Bolivar, do you, do you want to address that? Why is it the case that, that, that women haven't played that kind of role on the opposition side? Well, I, I'm going to try. I'm going to try. If I need help, I, I ask it. But uh, I think first, for the Chavism system, the feminism, the, the presence of women is completely instrumental because neither of these women take a huge decisions because the decisions, the important decisions that sustain the system, the, dominated, the domination systems are taken by men that are not only, there is not only Maduro, it's also military people and all, all that, uh, all that, all the stuff. So I think we have to look in the, in, you know, in the, in the structural, because for, for, I don't know, as, a, as a Christina said, the country right now has a lack of, uh, you know, need to show more leaders. And in the, and when you look in the parties, when you look who is leading in the communities, who is organizing the people, you find women's. You find women also in NGOs. You find women also, for example, in workers' more movements. So right now we have, you know, I, I think we have two obstacles, right? The system, the Maduro, the Maduro system, because there is no democratic, and we don't have we don't have options to put uh, to visibilize these names, these figures, because there is no press, uh, free, free, free free speech, we don't have medias, we don't have television, we don't have, you know, newspaper. Right now in, in Caracas, you cannot find a, 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 a something basic, a newspaper, you cannot find it because we don't have it. So for, you have a cultural factor that is, women are not part of the decision, but you also have a structural, a structural factor that cannot allow, visibility all these women that we cannot, you know, I think when, when we are fighting for inclusion, we cannot give, we cannot think that we are given this, you know, we have to fight this. For in, in, in this term, we are, we are trying to reunite all these uh, women that are leading in parties and the different parties, even in the Chavista uh, dissidents. And we are, we are trying to make an effort in, you know, workers' movements, social movements, humanitarian NGOs, to be civilized this because this is one of step to be, you know, to make them part of the, not only political process, also all the, the you know, the, the steps that the country needs to be uh, in, a, in a transition process. Great, thank you. Uh, Ambassador Zubia, would you like to add to that? I'll just quickly add a couple of uh, comments. Um, well, first of all, you have, uh, you know, MPs like Manuela Oliver, who is a very visible, uh, you know, politician inside Venezuela. You have uh, a couple of um, women leading political parties in Venezuela, uh, Maria Corina Machado, Delsa Solorzano, and, um, and you have many, you know, like 
even myself as a you know the, the top diplomat in the in the in the structure of the inter uh, of the interim government um but i i fully agree this is by no means enough but the one thing that i want to say is that we are probably creating uh, a revolution you know by this by not only this initiative and i'm not saying that this is the only initiative this is one of many initiatives that are breaking ground and uh, i hope that's, that um, that you know, with what what we explained at the beginning, if we can make uh, you know we can put the, enough pressure from within and from outside, this will be an I am certain that this will be an irreversible process, and we will be hearing from very talented Venezuelans, very outspoken and very talented Venezuelan women on the real issues, on the great issues, and the great solutions to move forward. So this is uh, just the beginning. Great, thank you for that. I'd like to move to some of the questions that the audience is beginning to ask. And, and we have a, an audience of people who follow international affairs uh, very keenly. Uh, and, and the first question uh, is, what in your opinion are, are some of the measures that could be taken to help move democracy forward in Venezuela and in improving the well-being of the Venezuelan people and the environment in holding the Maduro regime accountable in a meaningful way. And, and if I could just add to that question, uh, I think it reflects uh, a sense that Canada has played a role uh, in the Lima group, for example, but there have been important defections from that. Uh, there's Norway uh, starting the negotiation process, Mexico hosting uh, negotiations, Mexico suggesting that Venezuela should be at the summit for the Americas. All of this places a uh, country like Canada in a difficult position. You graciously all thanked Canada for the role that it's played, but I think it's a complicated um, position for Canada to be in at the moment. And so what would you suggest the international community in countries like Canada could do uh, to support the process of democratization in Venezuela? Anyone, uh, one of you could uh, be the first to, to start that. Yes, I'll, I'll have a take on that, <laughs> and then we'll, we'll see what uh, what uh, Manuela and Cristina can add. But um, I mean, there is one very important issue that needs to be clarified. Um, we have a dictatorship, a regime that is cruel, that it's a part of a of a of a, um, a criminal um, organization that 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 has taken or kidnapped. Uh, the state and, and a country and its citizens. So we, we need to be very conscious of the fact of what, you know, what we're fighting here. Um, then we have, you know, democratic forces in, 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 a, in a coalition of, 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 of political forces within Venezuela that conformed the interim government uh, with all the difficulties that it means to have um, the work that people, not only like President Guaidó does, but all the MPs like Manuela Bolívar and, 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 and the risks, not only personal, but also um, you know, the, 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 the collective risks that exist in Venezuela and, and to do politics and to, to be resistant of, you know, and, 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 and embody the democratic um, goals that we want for Venezuela. Um, and, and then we have the international community that also plays a role because we Venezuelans alone, we don't have the, you know, we don't have the tools to, to, to force a negotiation or to, to come uh, and, 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 and bring about a solution uh, in a negotiated table in Mexico. I mean, we have seen what is happening uh, with, with Mexico and who stands up from the Mexican talks and 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 and, 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 and which is the part that tries to sabotage the process continuously. So we need also the the implementation of the right tools and mechanisms from the international community. And of course, I'm referring to you know the pressure, whether it's you know diplomatic pressures in the forms of sanctions or whether it is the pressure from the international justice. Um, mechanisms that exist, like the ICC or uh, or others, you know, the, the, you know, universal 
uh, justice, the, the magnitude law, and the, you know, the different frame, legal frameworks, the indictments in the U.S. Um, there are different um, frameworks and, and tools to 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 put pressure on the on the on the people that are responsible on the regime and the people that are responsible for human rights violations. So I think that we need to do something that it's orchestrated in a way that it's uh, that it's coordinated, and we also need to think about elements that outside the box in the sense that we have not applied in the past, whether it's coordination, whether it's uh, the role of women in the process. I mean, we can think different things that we have not done in the past and that we should be doing um, moving forward. Um, and I do think that Canada plays a very important role uh, in orchestrating and leading and, and as it has done in the past, um, the international architecture and the, 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 the group of allies that, um, that have supported Venezuelan democracy and the Venezuelan the democratic forces within Venezuela. Just before moving on, uh, Ambassador Zubiaga, uh, are sanctions working? The sanctions make sense. Should, should Canada be persisting in sanctions at this point? Well, I mean, sanctions are the only, or not the only, but one of the main reasons why the regime would uh, consider sitting on the table. So if you don't have the sanctions, if you lift the sanctions, it's like, you know, like it's, you know, it, first of all, it would be very incoherent, uh, especially a day like today where we saw Prime Minister Trudeau and the Canadian government increasing the amount of sanctions against Russian, um, um, or, you know, oligarchs and people around Putin. So it just, you know, it, it, it wouldn't make any sense to have uh, Maduro, who is a sub subordinate of Putin, uh, you know, and lifting the sanctions on him and his and the, and the group of people that have committed, um, you know, serious crimes against uh, humanity and crimes against, you know, and violations on human rights. Uh, to me, it wouldn't make any sense. You know, sanctions are the, one of the reasons why they wouldn't even consider sitting, and, and, and they're not even sitting on the table um, yet. So definitely, uh, sanctions are important, but they need to be coordinated. In the past, we didn't have that coordination between the US and Canada and Europe. Uh, you know, the regime were, was able to bypass, you know, American sanctions. Um, so we, we need to have coordination, we need to have, I think that the world changed after February 24th, 25th, um, and, and people understand today much better what kind of uh, uh, risk uh, and what kind of adversary we have in Venezuela. And, 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 and let me tell you and, and, and the people that are listening, you know, that, you know, the, 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 the involvement of Russia in Venezuela, it's real. I mean, you know, I hear that, you know, like sometimes in, in Europe, because, you know, they're very far away from Venezuela, you know, they may not realize how, how close it is. And there is connection, there's diplomatic influence, there's military influence, there is uh, financial influence, there's political influence. I mean, this is something that we face as, 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 as we fight against this regime. So this is very important to always keep in mind. Thank you very much. Uh, Deputy Bolivar, do, do you agree with that assessment? Yes, I, I think we are in, in, in the country, we are going through, not right now, uh, since 2014, the worst crisis in humanitarian uh, issue. But uh, right now, the regime has shown that they are, you know, um, they are capable to put the money in the stuff that that they, that are not the the, the issues of, of the people. They that they have no completely interested to resolve the social problems, the humanitarian problems. And in that case, the only the only thing that make possible a negotiation through Mexico, the only thing that made possible to find electoral conditions that allow all Venezuelan people to have free elections to decide who is going to rule the, the country, the only things that made possible this uh, to obtain this through a negotiation is uh, is uh, ways uh, is the, the is the are the sanctions is the only thing that they are they they want because in in that case uh, right now 
they don't they don't care about the people they don't care about the human rights they don't care about the environment they don't care about anything and and it, this step uh, is really important to make you know to to bring the possibility to have negotiations and to bring that possibility and future to venezuelans it is uh, nothing more to add thank you very much uh Ms. Borelli, um, what, are, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I agree with um, uh, Isadora's assessment that Venezuela has turned into basically a situation where a criminal gang has kidnapped the entire country. Uh, Maduro, his wife, Celia Flores, the Rodriguez brother and sister, and a few others have basically kidnapped the country. And there is no democratic uh, possibility under this scenario. So sanctions are the only, it's the only thing that the international community has. Um, and mind you, most of the sanctions are against individuals. The regime wants to pitch the idea that the sanctions are hurting the Venezuelan people. The biggest sanction on the Venezuelan people were the, are the crimes and the insane measures that Maduro and Chavez took. The first one being when Chavez fired 22,000 top executive and employees of PDVSA and from then on destroyed PDVSA and turned it into the world's biggest money laundering machine. PDVSA is no longer capable of producing oil. That's why they turned to plundering Southern Venezuela for its minerals. Now, those sanctions really do hurt. And that's why they're so intent, as Manuela is saying, on the fact that they need to lift, that they want the sanctions lifted. Now, I think the world is starting to understand that if um, clearer signals had been given to Putin and his circle of enablers, when the annexation of Crimea happened, maybe we wouldn't be where we are today. So, you know, looking at Venezuela, I think we need to stand hard and fast by these sanctions and we need to consider new sanctions in particular in light of what's going on in Southern Venezuela with the environmental uh, devastation, the ecocide that is occurring there and the human rights abuses in particular against indigenous people. While I've got you, there's a question with regard to uh, gold trafficking in Venezuela. Could you speak a little bit to, to that? I, I think it's an interesting question. It goes to the complicity of the, the regime with this, and of course, the environmental effects. What are your thoughts on how important is that as an issue? Yeah, I mean, it's not only the complicity. Uh, literally, uh, when I say that the whole country has been taken hostage by a band of criminals, the Maduro regime has partnered with the ELN and the FARC dissident groups. So the Colombian guerrilla, they are partners in the control and exploitation of all the mines in, or lot, many of the mines, or the illegal mines uh, in Southern Venezuela. OECD published a report in September, 2021 in which SOS Orinoco participated. And the conclusion of that uh, uh, report, which is on the OECD website, is that 100% of Venezuelan gold is highly suspect, if not illegal, and it's funding international terrorism. So uh, those are strong words coming from the OECD. And I think um, the OECD is, is, is you know, becoming you know, very uh, proactive in making this known to OECD members and OECD member countries have to start realizing that they have to make sure that they are not um, inadvertently 
uh, you know, buying or being, you know, the Venezuelan gold is being uh, trafficked through their countries. Extraordinary. Thank you uh, very much for that. Uh, we're coming close to the end of our, our time, and I know you have other commitments, um, so we will honor that and wrap up uh, at the top of the hour. But uh, I, I would be remiss in not observing that none of you have mentioned the Inter-American Democratic Charter. Uh, the, uh, of course, as you know, the Summit of the Americas is, is coming up uh, next month, uh, and one of the major themes is uh, strengthening the uh, uh, defense and promotion of democracy in the context of the Western Hemisphere, looking at ways in which the Democratic Charter uh, could be reinforced. It's now over 20 years since it was, it was adopted. Is it irrelevant to the conversation in Venezuela today? It seems from what you're saying uh, that you don't place a lot of hope in it. Do you expect anything to come out of the summit process? Of course, there's been a lot of discussion about Venezuela not being invited and so forth, but, but clearly part of the agenda in putting democracy uh, as one of the major baskets for, for discussion is to strengthen the ability of the international community to deal with democratic crises, but in the context of a region that's as polarized as the Western Hemisphere is today. Is it possible to do better in terms of multilateral uh, preventive diplomatic work to support and to defend uh, democracy in cases like Venezuela? Well, I'll take a shot at that first, <laughs> because of course it's always possible to do better because we're not doing that well to begin with. Um, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm a very strong believer that, uh, you know, you have to be a militant of democracy. You cannot just sit and, uh, and, and stare as countries fall apart, as countries get polarized, as you know, autocracies get stronger, dictatorships, um, you know, are, are, are you know, we have multiple dictatorships in the in the hemisphere, and um, you know, it, it's 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 you cannot just sit and watch. So we need to really become militants and defenders. Um, the Inter-American Democratic Charter is one tool that was created precisely, you know, to promote. Uh, the strengthening of the democratic systems in the region. I strongly believe um, that uh, there are countries that have greater responsibility uh, because they have greater means and they have uh, stronger democracies. And I'm referring especially to Canada. I think that we need to build a partnership that allows uh, the countries that are not so lucky in the region and that have fallen behind on every democratic indicator, and I'm talking obviously about Venezuela, but there's Nicaragua, there is Cuba, and honestly, we cannot turn a blind eye on what happens uh, uh, in our own countries and on the countries, on our neighboring countries, because it affects us all. And um, I truly believe that it, the interest of countries should be to preserve, uh, you know, democracies and human rights, because that's, you know, that's what's efficient at the end, you know, like, you know, what's efficient is actually to be ethical and, and, and morally con consistent, consistent with uh, the values that, um, that are described in the, in, the, in the charter and that we all know more than, more than, you know, very well. Thank you. I Perhaps Deputy Bolivar, would you like to speak to this? And, and do you do you think that the OAS has done enough, or or has it done everything that it can? But its uh, hands are are tied. It has to represent all all member states, and there's such division in the region. Perhaps could you speak to that? Just the the difficulty of getting the hemisphere on the same page, even in the face of a situation as troubling as that of of Venezuela today. Well, really, uh, really short. I believe that right now Latin America have a lot of, you know, a, lo a lot of, um, how do you say that, um, grandes retos, a lot of challenge. Oh, yeah. And in a democratic, uh, in, in the case of Venezuela, we are, we are having support, but it's not enough. We have, as, as uh, Cristina said, as uh, Isadora said, we are fighting not only with a dictatorship, we, we are fighting with uh, against gangsters so it's not enough to 
pronouns, to the claims, to express. We need actions. And, and we are thankful for all the com international community for has, uh, what is done right now, not only in political uh, agenda, also in, in humanitarian, but it's not enough. And my, I'm scared right now because right now I'm living in Caracas and I'm, I'm really scared that Venezuela uh, going to, uh, you know, like a, in a forgive crisis, uh, no, you know, that, that anybody remember of Venezuela. And right now, each day, Venezuelans are crossing, are crossing the, the, the borders, not only to Colombia, right now, to US and, and different countries, because we are, as I say, we have a a 95 percent of the population under the poverty line, and we cannot. It's not enough to afford, you know, a elementary a, a elementary um, a insumos uh, as a food, as a health medicines, and and all the stuff. So, if the international community doesn't do something. This problem is not going to solve only for Venezuelan. Mm. We are working, we are organizing, even if we are, if, if we are frightened, even if we have uh, be in our families are, you know, are, um, are scared because we are fighting against against gangsters. But right now we have NGOs inside the country. We have political leaders inside the country. We have movements, social movements that are fighting Maduro, but it's not enough only us you know we need more strength actions not only in the in the latin american countries also canada and and i'm i repeat the the message of isadora that we are really thankful for all that canada is doing for venezuela but it's not enough thank you very much final word to you uh, ms borelli uh, in, in just a, a couple of minutes because we're just about out of time uh, any final reflections that you might have for us yeah, I mean, sadly, I think the people in Venezuela neither know or care about the summit. Uh, you know, this is far removed and 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 too esoteric. Um, and 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 very sadly, it's this whole issue of the summit has been managed very poorly by the U.S. Uh, this was a, a, obviously a, a great opportunity for the U.S. Uh, to 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 have an impact to make a mark, and they've they've completely missed that opportunity. Um, so, you know, they continue to recognize uh, uh, Guaido and so forth, but uh, it's, it's just very sad that, that uh, this has ended up, this summit that had held so much promise is not really panning out, at least for the Venezuelans. Great, well, um... Thank you very much. This has been uh, just a fabulous conversation. And I've learned uh, an enormous amount. Um, it's been uh, very inspiring to hear from, from you all. Uh, thank you for your participation and for taking the time to be with us. Uh, thanks to our, our audience for, for joining us tonight. And, and before closing, I want to thank the National Capital Branch of the Canadian International Council for hosting the event and to take a moment to recognize the contributions of the volunteers uh, who, who put this together, in particular, Stephen Baranyi, uh, Carolina Shimada, Gillian LeBlanc, <laughs> and Emilio Rodriguez. So, so uh, to them, uh, to you, and to our audience, uh, thank you very much, and, uh, and, and best of luck going forward. Good evening. Thank you so much. Good evening. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Professor Cameron, and the CIC, of course. Okay.